Paul is speaking about the, the great ministry of reconciliation. That man, that you and I were estranged from God. We were separate from God. And of course we know that this goes back to the fall of man. It goes back to the disobedience, the betrayal of everything that God had given to mankind. For the selling out of glory for sinful knowledge. The desire to be not just like God but the desire to be God, to be our own God. And we have reaped the bitter fruit of that decision throughout history, and indeed we reap it today. This is a great passage on reconciliation, and we preach on it very often, but I feel that we give as we so often give in our lives today, too much for man and too little for God. We preach very much from verse 17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And we have songs and books about new creation realities and, and once again we we turn something that is all about God to very much about us. And when we preach on that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus, we just brush over the Christ Jesus and then we speak about what it is like to be a new creature and all the benefits, which is truth, and it is true. And then the other great verse, of course, is verse 21. Great verse for the, the Reformation. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And we hear a lot about being the righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ. We hear a lot about um, what it is to be righteous before God. Um, we have claims, many are biblical, many are very, very good, and some are very unbiblical today. Cries from world famous preachers that. I can't be a sinner because I'm righteous. And how can I be righteous and a sinner at the same time? My, my answer is read your New Testament. Read your New Testament. It is there. It is this, this mystery that we are righteous before God and we, we are going to live our lives as righteous before God. And yet at the same time we are sinners saved by grace. But for me, the, the centre of this is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Because that is where it begins. There is no righteousness without this. We are still lost in our sins without God's decision from eternity to eternity to reconcile fallen man. Even before he was fallen. That we were to be reconciled. To God through Jesus Christ. God was in Christ. I remember that from our Bible school days. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself. And this is the center of what is known as the atonement. The atonement to, to atone for something means to. To, to make right again. It means to pay the price. It means when something has gone wrong, something has been done wrong, something is wrongful, that you put that right. We often say that we atone for our mistakes. We make a mistake and then we atone for it. Well, we made a mistake and God atoned for it. And it is a magnificent, it is a wonderful truth, the atonement. I remember when I was at Bible school and there was a, 
Um, the book, probably on the atonement at the time, was written by an Australian called Leon Morris, and it was called The Atonement. And that was probably the, 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 the greatest book that had been written on the atonement uh, until John Stott's The Cross of Christ. And if you can get a copy of, of that book, it is probably the book on the atonement. But of course, no book can compare with the book, the Bible. And the atonement is central in the Bible. For our sake, for our sake, he that is God made him that is Jesus to be sin, so that in him, Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Of course we are righteous before God. Of course we are to proclaim and explain and be overjoyed and sing about and pray about and preach about the fact that God was made sin for our sakes and that we are righteous before. It is just a wonderful truth. And the atonement is the work that Christ did in his life and in his death to earn our salvation and reconcile us to God. Christ has earned our salvation. Christ has reconciled us to God. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians uh, and the second chapter that for by grace are we saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is nothing of ourselves. It is not of ourselves because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And the atonement was that work that Christ did on the cross. And as John Stock puts, I don't think almost at the very beginning of his book, that at the very heart of Christianity, there is a cross. And on that cross, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, accomplished our salvation. It has all been accomplished. It has all been put right. It has all been atoned for. We don't have to go to a church and try to atone for our sins. We don't have to do something uncomfortable or painful or difficult in order to atone for our sins. You do not need a, a priest or a pastor or, a, or any man of God to as it were, be between you and God atoning for your sins. It has all been done for at the cross. And put simply, the atonement means that Jesus Christ, in his death, dealt completely with the problem of our sin. Our sin has been dealt with. The sin problem has been dealt with dealt with in Christ and um, whatever had to be done Christ did it however deep and awful your sin was whatever had to be done to atone for it Christ did it at the cross and now everyone who comes by faith in the completed work of the cross enters into what we call a full salvation it is a great word, full salvation. Sins forgiven, everything dealt with. Now we're children of God. We have a heavenly Father. We have a Saviour in the Lord Jesus Christ who is our Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And we have something as we were looking at in our small group Bible study that the, from the very beginning of the world the very beginning of God's people and throughout the whole of the history until the birth life and death of Christ there had never been and that is the Holy Spirit 
in us, for us, and with us. That is the full salvation that we have. When we read the Old Testament, we read of glory, we, we read of miracles, we read of grace, we read of mercy, we read of, of a nation being called by God to be the children of God and to have God as their father. But we do not read about the Holy Spirit of God, God himself indwelling every Jewish Israelite believer because it simply wasn't possible and because until Christ came was born lived suffered died ascended into heaven and until the day of Pentecost when the comforter that had been promised came when the promise that Jesus on the night he was betrayed gave to his disciples that it is for your good I go away because if I do not go away the comforter cannot come and then at the day of Pentecost it wasn't just tongues and, and, and power which there was there was also this wonderful promise of Jeremiah that God would take out the heart of stone put it in the heart of flesh and the Holy Spirit would indwell every believer. So no longer does a man or a woman have to say to their priest or their pastor or their spiritual teacher, show me God, because they shall all know me, says the Lord. And so in that one wonderful act of God's grace and power and mercy, the Holy Spirit in now indwells every believer. The atonement. It began with God. It began in the very heart of God, and we don't know when because it was from all eternity. Before God had created a single tree or a single a single cell or or, or, or a single planet, already in the heart and already in the mind of God was the atonement. He even knew when it was going to be. Because it says in Galatians 4 that in the fullness of time, when the time had fully come, in the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to, to save, to redeem, to set them free who were under the curse of the law. It began in the loving, merciful heart of God. And in the best known verse in the whole Bible, we read that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. And I love that word, whoever, because we are amongst the whoever's. And whoever comes to Christ is amongst the whoever's. And whoever repents of their sin is amongst the whoever's. And we can look at some of the deepest and, and most prolific verses in the Bible and we can look at the doctrines and we can, we can look at the different distinctions and we can look at theology and we can argue over all the points that uh, we, we find that uh, you know, there's, there's no cast iron <laughs> uh, evidence for one word or, or one opinion over another and we can have different opinions and we can have different opinions and I'm sure we have very different opinions to many of the churches here in this land about the free will of man and the sovereignty of God. We tend to be sovereignty of God ists over free will of man ists but it doesn't matter about our argument, it doesn't matter about where we are coming from. There is one thing that we can all be absolutely in agreement of, and that is that whatever man and whatever woman comes to God and asks God to forgive their sins, to, 
to, to put their faith in Jesus Christ, God will receive with joy and in glory. And God will not turn away a single man or a single woman and has never done in all history and will never do until Jesus comes again. That anybody coming to Christ, repenting of their sins, receiving Christ as their Lord and Saviour, God has said, Christ has said, I will not turn away. And that is what the atonement has done. It has begun in that loving, merciful heart of God. That, that God that we are in awe of. That God who is holy in absolute holiness. Who is just in his absolute righteousness. That God who in the Old Testament as well as in, in the New sets the standards sets the rules, sets the regulations for our fellowship. This God who demands our repentance, who demands our love, who demands that we love Him with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. This, this God who is to in, in no way be, be treated with, with anything other than absolute obedience and humility and awe and fear is also this loving merciful God who so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life and the gospel is offered to the whosoever Paul writes in Romans 5 and verse 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is another wonderful truth. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ gave his life. While we were still sinners, Christ appeared to us, revealed himself to us. While we were still sinners, Christ entered into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God shows his love. The atonement takes place because the love of God brings it about. God's attributes are one. We cannot separate one attribute from another. We cannot separate holiness from love or justice from love. He, he, he is one. Our God is one. One God, one spirit, one church, one baptism. We were looking at this this afternoon. It's, it's one God. And God has brought this about. And the attribute of the atonement that, that I believe um, really demands our, our worship is his love. His justice is there, of course, because um, the, the cross supplied the justice. The, the cross was able to justify us there is holiness here because the cross is a holy place. But there is love here. Because God shows his love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ atoned. Christ died for us. And the reason why the atonement is necessary is because of your sin and because of my sin. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And just before the cross, Jesus said in Matthew 26 and verse 28, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We'll be taking communion just after the message and uh, we will remember once again that Jesus said, 
This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for all, we could say, who come to him for the forgiveness of sins. And John writes in 1 John verse 7, in, in, uh, in chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. From all sin. No sin too, too, too hard, no sin too small. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We can look at sin and we can look at the fall and we can look at the depravity of man and we can look at everything that happens around us and we can look at today where there is very little good news, where there is so much terrible news being presented every day. But we can look at that, we can look at the world, we can look at the depravity of mankind, and we can still say that whatever had to be done about our sin, Christ did it. Whatever needed to be done about my sin, Christ did it. Hebrews 10, verses 17 and 18. And Christ did it perfectly and finally. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any other offering for sin. Christ has done it. But how does Christ take away my sin? How can I be clean? How can I be sure that my sins are forgiven and that God accepts me, we can be sure, simply because Christ atoned, Christ bore the sin, Christ bore the punishment that our sins demand by taking our place. For our sake, for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ died the death of sinful man. Christ died the death of you and me. Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. When we read verses like curse, we realise the wonder of our salvation. We realise the, the wonder of what God has done for us in Christ. In Christ. We realise what Christ has really done for us. He didn't just die for us. He became the curse for us. This means that Christ bore the curse, the punishment, the, the shame, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the terrible um, consequences of the fall of man. He bore all that so that you and I should go free. He bore what you and I should have borne. This is substitution. This is the substitutionary atonement. We're speaking about the atonement. I, I, I prefer really the word substitutionary atonement. And that is where the cross of Christ by John Stott, that's really where it takes its central place in the substitutionary atonement that God atoned for my sin, paid the price for our sin and he did it by dying in our place, our substitute as it were. He took your place, he took your curse, he took your punishment that you and I should have born. That is substitution. And we go through. And as Paul comes to the end of his wonderful teaching on the resurrection, he declares in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 to 57. And this is something that every single Christian should be crying from our hearts in glorious thanks. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where 
is your sting. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 is a magnificent hymn on the resurrection. Not just Christ's resurrection, but our resurrection. And it, it's, it's almost as if, you know, it, it just goes against everything of the spirit of this world. Because the spirit of this world wants to do everything to get us to forget death. To deny it, to, to pretend it's never going to happen. And so the spirit of this world is that we fill our lives with everything that we can to fulfill it. So that we don't have to think about death. And so we go to the cinema and we, we, can, we, are, we, can, we can watch uh, films that are pure fantasy. And, and today, wow, fantasy films, I mean... You know, I, I have to confess, I've never seen a Harry Potter film. Um, and that's not because I'm so holy that I, I would never see a Harry Potter film. It just has absolutely no interest. You know, I, I could watch the World Cup final um, and I can watch a lot of, a lot of uh, entertainment, but uh, I've never watched a Harry Potter film. But the, the world wants to kill us with entertainment, so we, we don't talk about death, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't mention it, it's as if, as if the one, the very thing that, uh, that we cannot avoid is the very thing that nobody wants to talk about, and sometimes not even Christians want to talk about the glory of our death. And so someone dies, and even Christians put on their Facebook page, you know, rest in peace, oh, I'm so sorry about that. You know, it can't be avoided. But what can be avoided is trying to avoid it as Christians. Because I think it says something about our faith. When we are not, as it were, looking forward to it. Because, you know, believe it or not, believe it or not, modern church of the 21st century, this is not the best. The best is yet to come. But we don't preach about the best is yet to come. We, even in the church today, we're trying to fill ourselves with stuff about today. When actually our glory is to come. Oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? Doesn't mean we don't enjoy life. I mean, we do enjoy life. We, 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 we love this life. But we are actually to, to love our deaths. And, and, and that sounds so ridiculous. But if it really is so, so, so much better where we're going, if at the blink of an eye we, we turn from this, this, this body of death, the, 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 the Paul's calling it, oh, you know, a oh, oh, wretched man that I am, who is going to deliver me from this body of death? The resurrection of Jesus Christ has become our resurrection. Doesn't mean that we go around with a death wish. I'm not saying that, but we go around proclaiming, oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? Because the joy of complete and final victory runs through the New Testament teaching on the work of Christ. Without Christ, we would be of men most miserable. We would be fearing death as we fear many of the things in our life. But we, we don't do justice to the gospel. We don't do justice in bringing people to the cross and doing everything we can to get them saved. If we cannot say ourselves, Oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? What should really be and what the Word of God makes very clear when we lose a loved one is, is that we grieve because we miss them. We miss them. 
We miss their presence. We, we, we miss the simple things that they did, the simple pleasures that they, they gave us. We miss them, but we do not grieve as the world grieves. The Gospels do not finish with the cross, but they are right on to speak of the resurrection. And the book of Acts shows the church living in the victory of the cross. But Acts also shows the church living in the power and the victory of the resurrection. And the victory of the cross and the resurrection, it just flows through the New Testament from first to last, from Matthew to Revelation. Throughout the New Testament, we're told that man's salvation rests entirely and only on what God has done in Christ. And the atonement is the very central doctrine of this. Without Christ's saving work, we are lost. In Christ we are wonderfully and gloriously saved. On the cross, Christ has won a complete victory for us. Christ has won a complete victory over all the powers of sin and death and hell, so that we can truly say, oh death, where is your victory? Mm -hmm. Romans 8 verse 37, after speaking about a lot of the things that, that you know, maybe are very difficult in this, in this world, mm -hmm. concludes by saying, in all these things, that is poverty, it is, it, it is conflict, it, it is uh, um, death itself. And he says, in all these things, we are not just conquerors, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. Through the death of Christ and his resurrection and his work in our lives by the Holy Spirit, bringing us to himself, bringing us to the cross, bringing us into the whole uh, blessing and joy of our salvation. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the death of Christ, for the cross of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that to the world it may look like a defeat. But to us, Lord, who were perishing and have been found in Christ. It is the greatest victory of all. That your cross, a stumbling block and foolishness to the outside world, is our glory. We glory in your cross because there we find life. We glory in your resurrection because, Lord, there is our future. We glory in your eternity because you have brought us into eternity with yourselves. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Holy Spirit, that you are from eternity to eternity. We thank you most of all that we are not from eternity. We are created in time, but we are now for eternity. We thank you, Lord, that no one can take away what you have won for us in Christ. Yeah. That no one can snatch you out of your hand. And that, Lord, we who know nothing of eternal things and nothing of eternity are now born again. New creatures who will never have an end. We are now as eternal as you are. And that is simply amazing. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We're going to